Welcome everyone to In the Green Room. I'm Kinga. And I'm Chet. I hope everybody's had a wonderful day so far. Uh, today we have Ronald Fry in the studio. Yay, Ron Fry. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. We've been watching wow. decades of war in the Middle East on television, you know, in the U.S. involvement there and some of these locations in Afghanistan. I mean, they loom larger than life in our imaginations because it's so hard to visualize what's there and they keep coming back. And the Pesh Valley is certainly one of those locations that we've heard about over and over and mm. over again. And we've tried to understand that. You are the first person since Alexander the Great to go into the Pesh Valley and achieve successful peace in the Pesh Valley as a special, special forces commander. And that has disappeared since you've left. And yes. that was the one time in history that that was accomplished, especially by a foreign entity. It's incredible. Yeah, wow. it, it, it's as you, as you describe it that way, it is kind of it, is, it sounds kind of incredible. It's like, wow, that's really impressive. Super <laughs> impressive. But it's funny because when we were doing it, we knew the Pesh Valley was a crazy place. Like the first time we, it's funny, the first time we were driving north and we turned left onto the road that goes into the Pesh Valley, our interpreter like leaned out the window and threw up. And he's an Afghan. He's like, nobody goes to the Pesh Valley. Like that's where people go to die. That's where the murderers. Oh, so the, he was just very oh, scared. Oh, yeah. It's like the Pesh Valley is kind of that place that nobody wants to go to. St. Louis. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> the St. Louis of Afghanistan. No, and, you know, so we looked at it from the perspective, not as much historical at the time as, okay, that's where the, the last known vestige of Al-Qaeda was. In 2003, that's the last place that everybody knew Al-Qaeda had, a, had a, a commander and a training camp. Uh, it's where all the fighters had gone that had mm -hmm. been defeated in other parts of Afghanistan. They all went to these craggy mountains that there was great hiding places. They all went to the Pesh Valley. And so when we got the mission, we were more amazed that we were getting this mission. We were actually going to go out there and live amongst these people and try and survive and try and accomplish our mission. And it was actually afterwards that we started looking at the historical context of what we had accomplished. And then it was kind of like, okay, not just in the Afghan war, but in like throughout history, that part of the country had never been pacified and they'd never had like a a third party come in and try and help them not only accomplish our objectives, but help them actually create peace amongst the tribes and the, and the clans and the, and, um, and the villages. So what would a day in Pesh Valley look like? Like, you know, you wake up, what happens? Give, give us kind of a. The great thing about it, it was never Groundhog Day. Like every day, <laughs> every, every day was, you know, it's like a box of chocolates, right? <laughs> every day you wake up and it's like, okay, so what's going to happen? Either we're going to get attacked, we're going to get rockets overnight, or we're going to you know, I'm going to come out and there's going to be a bunch of elders out front that want me to come adjudicate some fight between two villages, or we're going to train our soldiers and we're going to go on a mission with them, or we're going to, you know, travel over a couple mountains and visit some village that has never seen Westerners and try and sell them on why we're here to help them fight their enemies. So every day was different. Every day was exciting. And even when we had a plan, the day would never go exactly to plan. Just too much variability. And so many of us can remember exactly where we were on 9-11 when the trade, World mm -hmm. Trade Center was hit. You were already in the military and reading the book, that moment was transformative for your career and is what positioned you to go to Afghanistan in the first place. It was. I think, you know, the country had been at war for, with Al-Qaeda for about 10 years at that time, but very few people knew that. Very people knew who Al-Qaeda was. They didn't know that they were trying to fight us. And... I was actually in my special forces training, my officer training, and we were in a class in a room with no windows and we were actually being instructed on how terrorist nets and cells are organized, how terrorist groups organize themselves so they can't be captured, how they separate mm -hmm. themselves you know, from operations to intel. And we're in that class and someone puts their head in the door and says, hey, the, you know, the World Trade Center has been attacked by a plane. Mm. And we, everybody laughed because we thought they were trying to make the class like more relevant that, it, that it, was, it wasn't true. And so we continued with the class and then about 20 minutes later, or whenever the next plane hit, someone came in and said, hey, you guys, I need to come out here and look at the TV. Like the World Trade Center just got attacked like a second time. And when we went out in the lobby, you've got all these Green Berets that are in training and we're watching this big screen TV and watching the Twin Towers burn and then collapse. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the most somber like times I've ever had. Like you look around at everybody and everybody's like, okay, we were training for a theoretical and now what we're training for is real. And now we need to take this seriously. And we, we're going to be fighting in other parts of the world. And it was very, very real at that time. What were your thoughts at that moment? 
I was like, well, you know, whatever my plans were next year are probably not going to be the same. <laughs> and, and at the time, were you married? Did you have kids at that time? I was married with uh, two kids, and um, my wife was not pregnant at the time. But when I actually went overseas, um, she act we actually had our third about two days before I deployed. Wow. Um, oh, and wow. So at that, so at, but at that time, I, everybody in that room knew that, you know, their plans were different. Um, and it's kind of exciting because you're training for something that your country... The citizens are trusting you to get all this training and it's very expensive training. It's very deliberate and it, it's, you know, and you're like, okay, everything we're being trained for, we are actually going to be using this. We are going to be used to execute vengeance or we're going to fix this problem that just came upon us. And so everybody was more serious after that in the training. So in the Pesh Valley, it sounds like you really were having to be like a middleman and a peace broker, but how were you not more angry after like the events of nine 11? And like you were saying, you would ha want to have some revenge. Um, but you, your role there was more of like a, you know, peacekeeper. It sounds like. Yeah. So, so it's interesting. So when we went to Afghanistan, we got the mission to actually go out and live in the Pesh Valley and build a camp, recruit an army from local fighters, and then basically deny Al Qaeda the ability of using that valley because we knew that's where they they would hide. That's where they ha they would recruit soldiers, and then they go to other parts and attack people. So we were going to live amongst them and make it so that they were not welcome in the neighborhood anymore. Hmm. And Al Qaeda was really our enemy. The Taliban was more the enemy of the people of Afghanistan because the Taliban hid Al Qaeda, but the Taliban didn't attack the World Trade Center. And so when we went in early in Afghanistan, we decimated Al Qaeda and we decimated the Taliban because the Taliban was protecting them. And then really what we're doing at that point is we're like, okay, we just defeated our enemy and the enemy of these people because they wanted the Taliban gone too. And now it's our job to basically help them get strong enough that the Taliban and the terrorists would never be able to set up camp there again. And so our goal really at the beginning, and I think to be honest throughout, but at the beginning it was very clear. Our job, we defeated a, a, a common enemy. Now our job is to help this country get back up on its feet to make it so Afghanistan could never be a haven for terrorists again. Mm -hmm because that's good for them, but it's also good for us. Then we can go home. We don't have to worry about 9-11 happening 20 years later. And so, yeah, we were angry, but most of the time, the people that live there that would be affected by the Taliban's atrocities were the local people. Mm -hmm. And so when we could corral their hatred for the Taliban and what they did to them, and basically say, look, we're here to help you fight your enemies. Like, let's work together on this. Then it was less the you know Western Christians coming there and, and trying to convince these people to rat out their cousins so we could fight them. Mm -hmm. It was more of, these are your enemies. They've created a lack of peace in your country. Let us help you fix that. And, but in doing so, and in to, in to, in to gain the trust of the people, I felt like I was more of a mayor and a judge and like a, like a, like a peacekeeper yeah. for, that, for that time. And that's, that's how we got the trust. And when we had the trust, then they would help us accomplish our joint mission. So and, was this dealing with the leaders or are you just basically walking around just talking to everybody that you meet. So, so some of it was, you know, we, when we built this camp, you know, the army offered us to, you know, send a bunch of like CBs or engineers out to build this camp. And what we did is we just, we hired 60 locals and said, we'll hire you guys and pay you a fair wage to come on the camp and help us build it. And so immediately we had 60 families that had a vested interest in us staying alive because their livelihood was tied to us. And then we recruited local soldiers from there. And so we kind of had these relationships throughout the villages where, you know, we're going on patrols with sons and, and, and young men from those particular villages. Most of my dealings were with the government officials and the elders. Every village has a group of, you know, it's kind of a class patriarchal society, right? Every village has a handful of like old guys that make all the rules for the village. And so if you're trying to win over the village and sell to them, you meet with, they call it the Shura, and it's just a handful of old wise guys from the village and you sell them on what you're doing. And if they like it, great. If they don't, well, then you're in trouble. And so I spent a lot of time being the, basically the mouthpiece for the American military to those people, those power brokers. So you were the liaison. You dealt with the people. You were the one yes. that went out, not, your, not the other... They would come with me, but usually we would, we would funnel all that stuff to the commander so that everybody knew there was, there was one commander, there was one American warlord, warrior king, that any problems had to come to him. Otherwise, they try and go to different guys and mm -hmm. play mom and dad. You know, get an answer from him, and then if you don't like that, go to the other guy. So all those would have to come to me. 
so that we had a consistent message. And one thing we, I think a lot of us don't understand is that the people of Afghanistan are armed to the teeth. They yes. have weapons and rockets. I mean, Americans like to think they're armed. The Afghanis are armed. Where did they get all these weapons that they're hiding under their beds and in their garage and wherever else? You know, the, the statement you made, it is amazing. Like, I don't think people understand. And the Pesh Valley is, you know, if everybody has weapons, the Pesh Valley is like the Costco of weapons. I mean, it's like, you know, and what, they, what happened was it's, it's like currency to them right now, right? Because they're a very warlike people. They've been in conflict for at least 3,000 years that we know of, right? Since mm -hmm. Alexander the Great, they've been like invaded and defeated those invaders for 3000 years. And so their part of their culture is their ability to fight and their ability to wield weapons. And so when, when the Afghans, you know, back in the seventies, when the Russians were there and the Afghans were fighting against the Russians, there was all kinds of weapons that flowed in from other countries, including the U S that were arming these guerrillas to fight the Russians. And then in any guerrilla warfare, when they would kill a bunch of Russians or do an ambush, they would take all the weapons from the Russians. And then the Russians would bring more ammo and weapons to resupply their guys, and then they would be taken again. And so it was, it was amazing. We'd, do, we'd find out that somebody had weapons, and you know whether it's good intel or bad intel, we'd go do a, a, a search. And I'll never forget the one we did with a guy that, you know, we show up at his house, we said, hey, we understand you have some explosives, and you know, we, we need to search your house. And, oh, really? You would go to their homes and say this? Oh, yeah. No, wow. that, that's after we secured the compound and had guys all over. So if they wanted to resist, it was like, that's probably not a good idea. Hmm. And then we'd be polite. Like we never blew off their doors and like humiliated the women or anything like that because that just creates bad blood. But they would deny it. And then we brought in a, um, a metal detector and it was hilarious. <laughs> like um, we told this guy, look, we're going to find it. And it was just one of those ones you do on a beach that was painted like, like sand, right? So it looks like a military piece of equipment, but it's like, Anybody that goes to the beach in the summer sees like old guys like trying to find a watch, right? That's all it was. And we said, look, this is, this is ground penetrating radar. If you have anything, even one bullet, we're going to find it. So you might as well tell us so that we can stay friends. And he's like, okay, I've got a couple. And then he takes us into like his kid's bedroom. And there's like literally like an Afghan crib. He moves it out of the way and we dig it up. And there's like, like dozens of rockets like buried under the crib, like big, like huge explosives. And we start... While we're trying to dig this out, I told some of our Afghans, I was like, hey, why don't you take this toy out into his fields and just, you know, just see what you see. And for the next, the rest of the day, he'd be like, oh, here's another one. We start digging. We started bringing in locals. Said, hey, we'll pay you five bucks. Help us dig. And we're digging up this guy's field and we keep finding him. And it was funny because he's watching and he's like, ah, oh, geez, they found my stash. And then <laughs> we go to one by the river and we find it. He goes, hey, that's not mine. Someone buried that on my land. And it was just like, dude, you can't even track, keep track of your own explosives. <laughs> and, you know, after we we're doing that day in and day out, we just realized, okay, everybody has them. Like, and an incredible amount. It's not like, you know, we think in America, someone has more than four guns and it's like, oh, this is a gun nut. Over there, it's like, you know, and, and if they don't have it on their land, they'll hide it up in the mountains and they have a cave where that's their stash. It's, it's hard to fathom, but it's all over that country. Where do they get them? They, well, they captured them. And even now, you know, Pakistan, Iran, there's all kinds of warring factions where outside parties are continuing to give more weapons to them. So even if you find more, um, there's still more out there. And, and then, then when the Taliban come in, they don't bring their own guns. They bring dollars and they're buying their weapons as they go from the locals. That's right. That's right. It's almost like they, you know, we envision that they would come over from Pakistan to attack the Americans or whatever. And they bring like, you know, a bunch of like pickup trucks full of weapons. And really they just come with a bag of money. And they just go and say, hey, we need, um, I got a shopping list of what I need. And then they'll buy it from people and then they'll hire people to fight. And you might only have four or five real fighters and they might hire another 10 or 20 guys. And Afghans are like, oh, you're going to pay me to fight? Well, that's what, I'm Afghan. That's what I do. And then they go do an attack and then they go back to farming the next day. So it's really, you know, so the, the goal with the Al Qaeda guys is you got to convince the locals that you don't want to fight against us. You want to fight against them and you want to give your weapons to us, not them. And then, the, and then the Al Qaeda and Taliban guys are kind of castrated. So you oversaw one of the first only and only peaceful times in the Pesh Valley. And this harmonious streak lasted around a year, right? Yes. And then what do you think led to the situation devolving after you left? So, so one of the things that I think we're learning, like as a society and as a military, that, you know, um, what we do is we take a unit, we'd send them there for a year 
and they would learn all the locals, they'd learn everything going on, and then at the end of the year, we'd pick them up and they'd go home and we'd bring another unit out. And so in essence, in all these different areas, we've really been there, you know, about 20 years now, but really we've been there for one year, 20 times. Mm -hmm. And so if we had learned all these lessons over a year and we try and pass the baton on to the next team, but if they come with a different philosophy or a different idea on how to go about it, it could be better, it could be worse. Mm -hmm. And so in our instance, you know, we actually made a lot of mistakes and learned from those mistakes. And what, like what, what mistakes? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to some of those in a second, but most of what I wrote about in the book, they're lessons learned. And you don't learn lessons from what you did right. Mm -hmm. You learn lessons from what you thought was going to be right. And it was a huge mistake. And you're basically saying, okay, let's never do that one again. Mm -hmm. Right. And so yes. most of the book is, okay, guys, if anybody does what we did, don't do this because this is what happened. And we recovered from most of it because we were humble enough and we built enough relationships with the people that they forgave us for a lot of the, the faux pas we made. But the guys that came after us, their objectives were a little bit different and they mistook the piece that was there for this, this, this valley isn't as dangerous as we thought it was. And so they got a little bit reckless mm -hmm. and they made some mistakes and they killed some civilians on accident. Well, it wasn't on purpose. It was collateral damage. It was, hey, we're trying to get the right guys, but accidentally we damaged property or people. Mm -hmm. And in their culture, you don't damage property or people and not compensate or fix that because they do an eye for an eye. So if you make a mistake and you don't fix it, they will come after you. And next thing you know, violence escalated. And within six months after we left, you know, the valley that was peaceful, that kind of was working very well with the Americans got pretty violent. And you learned from Vietnam, from an experience in Vietnam. Because when you went in there, you were recruiting local fighters, training local fighters, working with the locals against the Taliban, for example. Yes. And to do that successfully, you had to learn some special lessons um, that Americans had uh, learned the hard way in Vietnam. Yes. Can you walk us through that process? Yeah. So, you know, one of the problems of, you know, you get this mission that you're going to raise a, you know, an army from the locals. Well, there's, there's no lesson manual for how you do that. Right. You can, you can't put out like a wanted ad and you just have a bunch of soldiers show up that are going to be loyal and work with you. And so trying to, you know, in Vietnam, we learned in a lot of times where we're, we're training local villagers to protect their village, but then the Viet Cong or the enemy would infiltrate and a couple of the guys would not be from the village. Mm -hmm. And the others are afraid to tell you that, Hey, that guy's bad because they don't want their family targeted. So the Americans are training these soldiers and one night, some of these bad guys sneak in and, and slit their throats. And so we lost a lot of good Americans that were trying to train the locals, but the enemies kind of took advantage of what we were trying to do. And so, you know, we're trying to figure out, okay, so if our mission is to be in the Pesh Valley and we're trying to convince these Pashtun Muslims that some of their cousins are bad, we want to train you to work with us to find these bad guys. Mm -hmm. How do we find the guys that are actually wanting to work with us as opposed to guys that infiltrated because they wanted to get on our camp so they could kill us. It's a real question. Like it's not, that's not an academic concern. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we had a lot of discussions amongst our team about how we would, how we would do that. And it was, um, Mike, the medic was just like, hey, let's just, let's hire all the sons of the elders. Um, you know, and he took an example from like from the Book of Mormon. It was just like, hey, let's just, let's just hire the sons of the elders because then we know we can trust them. And if anybody was to turn on us, we know where they come from. We're not just hiring random guys. And it's funny, but when we gave the elders the respect that we trust you, we're trying to do this for you in your valley. We're trying to secure your valley, but we need soldiers. So you need to give us your sons and your nephews, people that we can trust. And they need to show up with their own weapons and a letter from you validating that these guys are good guys. And we never had one problem. These guys were loyal. These guys risked their lives for us. These guys truly became citizen soldiers of that valley because they believe that what we were trying to do was not fight our enemies and then go home. We were there helping them secure their own valley. And so they took total ownership of it. And, you know, and it's, it's, it was kind of an emotional thing at the time because you look at what they're risking, right? So they, their family's been there for generations and they're willing to partner with the Americans to fight against Afghan and other Muslim fighters. And knowing that if the Americans failed or if we turned our back on them, they could be giving up their life, liberty, you know, their sacred honor, like their families could be killed, their, their land that's been in their families for generations could be taken, and they would be killed. So it wasn't a, wasn't a, a moderate risk for them. 
And so for them to step forward and then perform the way they did was actually incredibly validating and encouraging for Afghanistan. So here you are working with the kids who are the soldiers now and impressing the parents who wrote the permission letters. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And in that process, you emerge as the ultimate warlord for the region for two reasons that were interesting. One is you had the most guns representing yes. the U.S. military. So whoever has the most guns has a lot of status. And then number two, interestingly, and that no one would expect, is that you ha naturally have red hair, and so you naturally grew a red beard. Yes. And in their culture, <laughs> serendipitously, red beards are a major status symbol. Yes. Why it, is that? It, well, it's funny, you know, because that, that, just that point that genetically, you know, I'm more like a leprechaun and I have strawberry blonde hair, but when I grow a beard, it's red. Um, and so, that, so it's, it's very red. It's very red. <laughs> and in that culture, um, the leader of a tribe or a leader of a village would actually take red dye like henna and he would dye part of his beard so that everybody knew that he was the leader of the village. Really? But they don't grow naturally red beards, right? That's mm -hmm. a, so when they see this American that is dressing in their clothes and grew out his beard because in their culture, if you're a man, you have a beard. That's just their culture. If you don't have a beard, then you're an infidel and you're not a man. And so you've got this American that's a commander that's commanding all these people, has all these guns, and he has a red beard. So in their mind, it's like, oh, this is a natural leader, right? This, this, this guy was made for us. Mm -hmm. And I think when they kind of got it under their mind that, you know, they, they're used to the Russians or they're used to, you know, when they'd see American military, they'd see guys with helmets. They actually referred to them as the helmeted ones, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then they see Americans that show up and we're wearing their clothes. We have beards. We're talking with them. I mean, we have an interpreter. I didn't speak Pashtun, but we're trying to abide by their culture. We're buying stuff on the local market. We're eating with them. They're like, well, this is, this is great. We can deal with this guy. This guy's more like us. <laughs> and he's actually, you know, and we just always pitched what we were doing as we're here to help you guys with your problem. Like we came here to help you. We don't, it's almost like our agenda is whatever your agenda is to create peace in this valley. And once they grabbed onto that, they're like, well, let's take advantage of this opportunity because they'd never had a group that was there that could provide that for them where it was a, a third party. It wasn't just another warlord that was trying to rule everybody else. Um, yeah, it was kind of interesting. You know, and that's why we, to make a religious point, why we have to read original scripture ourselves, I think, because the lessons are in there and they're sideways. Like you wouldn't have recognized the significance of hiring tribal leaders, you know, relatives to be in your army that phrase came into your mind from the Book of Mormon. You probably read it somewhere. Never appreciated that at the time, but that would be a major war strategy. You know what I mean? Yes. So, where, yeah. Where you're reading religious text and you're like, okay, would I ever use this in a foreign country in actual war? Yeah. Um, but having that in your hard drive, then when you're in a situation amongst other people that are very religious, they take, you know, it's like, you don't have to agree with their religion. You just have to recognize that their religion is important to them mm -hmm. and respect it and ask for that same respect coming back. But I think that, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about that special forces are a little older, a little bit more experienced. And that experience can come from business, it can come from family, it can come from training, it can come from your religious background, but all those things kind of coming together so that you can understand what's important to the other person on the other side mm -hmm. that you're speaking to. And, you know, we found the Afghan culture, there's a lot of things about it that it's very, from our perspective, it's very backward some stuff that is very, very respectable and we could almost see, man, we are so similar. And then other stuff that we felt was very backward and somewhat barbaric. They would see the same thing from us. Hey, mm -hmm. there's this overlap, but these guys don't believe exactly the way that we are. And we've been told they're like horrible people and we should kill them. But there's so much about us that's similar. Let's at least see if these guys can bring something to us. And so it's the same thing we're asking them to do for us. We have to take that experience and apply that and, and do it with them. And and for us, especially, you know, we had, a, we, had a, we had a Buddhist, we had a lot of philosophical guys on our team. We mm -hmm. had an older team and we had um, like half the team was, was, was LDS. And so we had a- support, Really? Yeah. Half, half the team was LDS. Okay. And, you, and you find a lot in special forces because, you know, most, mm -hmm. you know, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that serve overseas mission, they, they, they learn another language. And in special forces, you have to have a second language. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you have a lot of them that gravitate over there. You have to have a second language, and that's why there's a lot of LDS. Yes. Okay. And the army will teach you, 
but most of the guys like I did, I already had mm -hmm. French. I was like, well, shoot, if the army's going to teach me a language, uh, they sent me to Monterey, California for 15 months to learn Mandarin. I was like, this is a great deal. And so you find a lot of the, a lot of the LDS guys will have two and three languages on the teams, but it's, it's just, it's just, there's a higher percentage of them there. But the great thing is on a 12 man team, you'll have different philosophies, different experiences, different beliefs. You, you basically have the same core desire to do what we do, but you can pull on all these different experiences when you're dealing with people in a foreign place where it's very difficult to do that. If you're 18, you just graduated from college or high school and you go to this foreign place and all these guys have beards and you're like, man, I just got dropped off in Oz, <laughs> you know? And so, so our team had an advantage in the fact that we were older, had more different experiences to pull from. And I think that that played to our advantage. So did you know the person that um, actually shot Bin Laden? No. I mean, I know who he is, but I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't know him before that. And, and, and did, did everybody, was it kind of everyone's mission to get him, to, to kill him? Yeah, that, you know, back in the day, it was, you know, the first there was a $25 million bonus, and then there was a $50 million bonus for, for Bin Laden. I mean, that's, I don't know if there's ever been a higher price on someone's head. And one of the reasons we went in the Pesh Valley is that Osama Bin Laden actually had in-laws there. Like, one of his wives came from the Pesh Valley. And what's interesting is, you know, like in serious history, when Alexander went through Afghanistan, that's the place where he allowed his soldiers to take wives. And so there's a lot of European looking Afghan women in Nuristan and Kunar province and the Al Qaeda Arabs seek after those women to be their wives. It's interesting. And so a lot of the Al Qaeda guys would go to that area because they wanted to seek after these lighter skinned, green eyed women that were still Muslim, but they just looked very different than most other like Afghans. So Bin Laden, how many wives did he have? Oh geez, I think he had like six. I'm not sure exactly how many he had in the end, but, but yeah, so, he, so we, he had been sighted in the valley. When we went there, it was because, okay, well if not only do they have a, an Al Qaeda commander there, but they felt that you know, Osama had been there or was there. And so there was a big push to go out there and, and basically deny that area for him. But everybody was focused on, you know, everybody's trying to gather intel on where he was. And we all felt he was in Pakistan. We just didn't feel like that part of the country was safe for him. And we were getting intel all the time on smaller commanders. If somebody had seen like Osama, they would have told us. And so I don't think he felt safe there, at least at that time. But it was funny because we'd go to these meetings and I loved it because we'd get, we'd go to this, uh, you know, they have a shura for their district. And so in that area, there was three districts. And so we'd go, you know, north two hours and we'd go to this place that very few people have ever seen. Like nobody in the West has ever been to this area. All these elders come out of the woodwork and you have this meeting with them. And I'll never forget we're having this one and we reminded them, we're looking for Osama bin Laden. If you have any intel on him, you know, you know, the U.S. government is willing to pay you, you know, $25 million. And someone said, well, how, how much is that? Well, it's $25 million. Um, let me put it in terms of how many goats that is. <laughs> and, and then when you explain it to them, they're like, oh, oh, well, that's a, that's a lot of money. <laughs> but when you're telling them $50 million, it's like, okay, well, I don't know how to explain that to you. Oh, let me put it in your terms. And then all of a sudden they were like really excited. Um, but there were some places that had not seen Westerners that at, they didn't even know the Russians were gone. Like, oh, because I mean, they never go into town. So they're way out in the boonies and we're meeting with them. Like, you're Americans. Why are you guys here? Well, didn't, you guys didn't hear? And it was, it was just, it was almost like you're going into wow. like a time machine in some of these places, but I really enjoyed it because the people were just fascinated by us being there. And then we could do an exchange of value. We'd buy stuff from them. They were excited about us. Um, I always had people coming and wanting to see the red bearded commander at, <laughs> at the camp and they would like bring gifts, you know, I and told them. how my, was the food there and who would feed you? I mean, would you guys cook? Some, sometimes it was really good. Um, and how did you trust that the food was safe to eat? Well, because we, we were eating the same food as they were. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, on our, on, our, on our camp, by the time, you know, we had 130 Afghan soldiers that we trained and we, we hired a cook and he would cook the food for everybody. And then we would, we would share. When we actually went and we would eat with elders, um, it freaked me out the first time, but one of my Afghan soldiers would actually taste my food before I would eat because he, he knew that these... Um, Al Qaeda had put out this plan to kill the Americans by poisoning tea or food when they eat with the Afghans. And so there's always that fear that, hey, you're amongst people that you think are friends, but maybe they're gonna try and kill you. And when our soldiers had kind of heard that rumor 
And it's funny, we got the intel from the CIA about three days after our soldiers told us that they had heard this is what Al Qaeda was going to try and do. And so our soldiers just started tasting my food before I ate it, which the first time I was like, why did that guy just dip his, like, his bread into my bowl? <laughs> But after that, it was like very flattering. Like these guys not only were willing to risk their life to, to protect me, but they were telling everybody there, if you try to do something to the commander, you're going to kill one of your own first. And so we never had that problem. Um, but the food was pretty good. You know, you had beef, chicken. Sometimes I'd get a, a plate full of food that was like, you know, a kneecap from a goat, something like you had no idea what kind of meat it was, but you ate it. What was it like always having to watch your back like that though? And always knowing that there was that threat on your life. You know, it was, it was, it was weird because I didn't realize till we actually got home, you know, most Americans overseas, right? Whether it's in Iraq or Afghanistan, you're in a, in a large American fire base or, 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 or fort, if you will. And you go out on patrol and then you come back and you can take off your helmet. You can take off your body armor and you go into the chow hall and you can watch a football game. And it feels like you're back in the States mm -hmm. and you feel somewhat protected. Well, we had a base that was very small and we're sharing it with 130 Afghans and we had Afghans coming on our base all the time. And so it felt you never really could relax or let your guard down. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize until we got home that I was exhausted mm -hmm. and you know, yeah, you could sleep, but you could never just like let your hair down and relax yeah. because you felt like at any time you have to pick up your gun and you're going to fight. Mm -hmm. Were there any moments where things felt like helpless with the situation and you thought you guys might have to return home? Or once you recruited those, um, the children of the elders, did things kind of move smoothly from there? You know, there was, there was a couple times that we had, um, you know, we, had, we did have, we called it the uprising amongst our own soldiers, where there was some built up tension amongst the soldiers that, you know, the details around that we don't need to get into, but it's like there was some built up tension. And then one of my medics had disrespected one of the soldiers that came from a, a really important family. And he kind of humiliated him in front of his other soldiers and kind of called out his manliness. And he didn't mean to do it. He was angry. The guy had made a mistake that could have cost others their life. And he just went a little bit too far. And they were so offended by that, that the man had to defend his honor, that our soldiers were kind of split of Hey, are we going to walk out of the base or are we going to get in a fight with the Americans? It was a very emotional, like one day period where, you know, my guys didn't, we didn't know where it was going to go. And then we diffused it. We listened to what their issues were. We tried to address them. We apologized, which, you know, you're the American, you've got all the guns, you've got all the power, you've got like bombers overhead. You feel like we're the most powerful people like at that time, but it's like, okay, I need this guy's relationship and his complaints are legitimate it's nothing wrong just apologizing and acknowledging that what we did was wrong and making peace. And I think if we hadn't, we would probably would have lost some people and we would have lost half of our soldiers. It sounds like you did a great job not letting your ego get in the way. I think a lot of people let their mm -hmm. ego get in the way and you know, wouldn't have been as uh, accommodating as you were. Did you ever have a f one of your closest friends die? So I had a lot of friends die in Afghanistan and Iraq in different, different areas. Mm -hmm. But on our team, we actually didn't lose anybody. Wow. Um, we got a couple of Purple Hearts. We had people that got wounded. Um, same with our Afghan soldiers. But we didn't lose any of our Afghan soldiers or any Americans that operated in the Pesh at that time. Which, now looking back historically, that was a big deal. Because eventually we lost like over 120 Americans in the Pesh Valley. And it was the, that area was where more Medals of Honor were earned. And more bombs were dropped. And more fighting was done in the entire war. So the Pesh Valley encompasses um, places where, you know, Wanet, where we had a huge fight. Um, the story Lone Survivor is part of the Pesh Valley. The Korangal Valley is just off of the Pesh Valley. That was within five miles of our camp. Wow. So all these crazy fights and violence and loss of life on both sides happened in the years that followed. And so really looking back is when I realized, okay, we made a lot of mistakes, but we actually did pretty good because the people accepted us. The and fact you had no deaths on your team, that's crazy it was the most violent area. Yeah, no, it, it's, and for me, like, you know, I feel really blessed as being the commander because we made a lot of mistakes, but we never had to really pay for it with blood. Mm. And we fixed the mistakes and we learned from them and we actually adapted. And that was like a huge blessing. And especially because, you know, in their culture, if you take innocent life or you take someone's life, in their culture, they have the option of forgiving you 
and you can basically pay a family for having wronged them. So it's like, hey, I'm, you know, it's like, hey, I, I was a drunk driver. I didn't mean to kill your child. Please forgive me and I'll give you money and I'll give you whatever else to try and make penance, but let's have peace. And the family can say, okay. Or they can say, no, we're gonna kill someone in your family. Wow. And it's really, they, they choose one or the other. And we saw several times where while we were there, we'd see fights begin between families and villages. And there were some that we saw that had been there for 200 years. Where That's when crazy. they told us the beginning of this feud, it came from, you know, somebody accidentally killed someone in their town or they jacked with their water rights and they just keep fighting back and forth. And so we always went the route that rather than challenging their manliness that, hey, yeah, we made a mistake, but what are you going to do about it? It's like, hey, we're sorry. Let's make good on it and let's move on as friends. And I think that saved our life because we, we made some mistakes that cost people life. And you mitigated some of these decades old conflicts among these families. They came to you and saw you as an authority figure and looked to you for wisdom and accepted your solutions. I mean, you're King Solomon. Yeah, it's, it's funny. It's like, cause you know, my, my commander, when he told me going out there, as he told me, it's like, hey, you're going out there to accomplish something for the US military, but you're gonna be surprised. These people are gonna look at you as a king. They're gonna look at you as a, as a, as a judge, as a, as a wise man. And I kind of like, no. And within weeks of being there, it was almost like they were craving to have this third party that was willing to help them solve a problem that they couldn't solve amongst each other because there's such bad blood. And almost by having someone come in between and say, okay, let me hear both sides. What can we do to kind of solve this and help you guys like get through this? And sometimes it was, hey, you're angry about water rights. What if US military, what if we took our money and our soldiers and we came and we helped both of you build a new well? And you know, we want you guys to be friends because we want to work with you. Why don't we help you guys do that? Would that be acceptable? It, it costs us nothing. And they're like, oh, that's, that's great. You Americans are awesome. What do you need from us? And then we would get intel, we get soldiers, we get help from them. And really what we did is instead of them fighting each other, we got them working with us to fight a common enemy. And I think that was one of the things that looking back was one of the most satisfying thing is we had a ton of refugees come back to the Pesh Valley because they were told that it was safe. And we had a bunch of these villages and people that had been at war that came to peace and then joined with us in basically making the valley safe. So, so Ron, we have a uh, new intern here, uh, Ava, and she has some questions for you. Uh, okay. we, we were going to talk about something else, but she is just going to ask you some questions. Okay. So when you were in the Pesh Valley, there's a lot of different cultures. Do you think that you had a culture shock when you came back here? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was tough. For about three months later, I always reached up and felt my face. And I was like, wow, who is this guy? Right, because I was clean shaven. My wife did not like the beard. Um, she was not as enamored with it as the Afghans were. Um, and it was weird. I would wake up in the night and like freak out because I'd reach over and I, I couldn't find my rifle. Like it was almost like a security blanket that I always knew that if something, okay, okay, it's there. Everything's gonna be okay. And I'd wake up and it was like, okay, where am I? What's where's my weapon? And I have to turn on the light and I'm like, okay, I'm home. And so a lot of it was just adjusting to civilian life. But you know, then you go to Costco and it's like we were eating like like goat elbow and that, I mean, that's what we were eating. And then you go into Costco and it's like, wow. You know, there's a scene in um, uh, Hurt Locker where he's walking down the aisle and he's so overwhelmed with the choices of cereal. And I was like, I totally get that because you get used to living the way that you are and you get used to this adrenaline drip mm -hmm. that's constantly there. And your lifestyle is, hey, could it, today could be the day. I know we're gonna be in a fight. I don't know what type of fight it's gonna be. And then you come back to civilian life and it doesn't matter what your job is. It, it feels insignificant. It feels boring. It feels like I went from doing what I'm doing and like I've got this loss of purpose and stuff. So yeah, it was, it was, it was tough. Your next question. Next question. Um, I would say, did you have to rely on your brothers in arms a lot or was it more like actually support from the people? So, the, you know, we never went on missions without at least one American. Right, and so even if we went on a mission with 20 Afghans, we'd always go at least with one other American, right? For one is if one of the Americans got wounded, you know, you have to have someone that can call aircraft or something, but it's also, you also need, uh, we believed in the Afghans, but it was always like, look, if something happens to me, this guy will bring me back. And so you always trust your, your brother and we're trying to make the Afghans our brothers, but you know, we were, we were like a family and we lived together for all this time and we're dealing with all this 24 hour stress. And 
we fought like a family, like we were friends like a family, but I trusted those guys with my life. And if they were gonna be in trouble, we'd do whatever we had to like bail them out. How often do you see those brothers now? You know, we talk not as often as you'd think, but if you were to ask me who's your best friend and who you think about, I feel like I've talked with him yesterday. It's just one of those things where outside of my, my um, you know, those handful of best friends you've had since you were a kid or my blood brothers, those are the guys that I feel the closest with because you've sacrificed, you've seen things, you've endured things. And when we do talk, you know, we got to, when I was doing the book, we actually got together and had a reunion and I basically wanted them to give input on their perspective on what they saw. And it was funny because I wrote the book and the outline from my perspective. And then when we got together, there was events that I totally forgot, but to them that was more impactful, right? And so we kind of had this great opportunity for everybody to share their stories and then kind of incorporate those into the book. But um, we talk often, not as often as you think, but, it's, but when we do talk, it's almost like no time has passed. You'll have to bring them to the show. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I mean, I think these, it'd be really fun. These are the amazing stories that we'll never get from the news media. And they're so inspiring and so humanizing about the Afghanis. So yeah. just, it's just wonderful to hear them from you straight from the lion's mouth. Well, and one of, one of my brothers is right here in Arizona. And like oh, next really? time. Yeah, if we, you know, because we kind of put this Bring together. him next time. Oh, totally. Oh. Jason would love to come. He'd be great. Okay, next month. We'll yeah. do that. And he's much more entertaining than I am. It's very funny. <laughs> You're very entertaining. We've, we've been enjoying this. Do you have uh, one last question? What Ava? do you think was the scariest moment that you had over there? Um, you know, we had, we, had, we had a lot of firefights, but I never felt that we were overwhelmed by the other side. You know, there's, this, there's a certain feeling of indestructibility on the American side. So when we actually got in real firefights, that was the most, that was exciting, but we always felt like we would win. It was times where... You know, there's one time where we had an IED destroy one of our trucks and we were out there in the boonies and we were stranded and we knew that the bad guys were coming. Mm. And it was like, okay, well, we're not in a position to get out of here. And the bad guys are coming and it's getting dark. That was one that was, that, you know, you felt like, okay, this will be interesting. And then there it was more, a couple situations we were negotiating with the elders where we had made a mistake. Either one of us or our Afghan soldiers had taken life um, on accident and now you're sitting with these people and negotiating for peace and in one of the instances they said they didn't want peace they wanted blood and we were in a room trying to negotiate with these people and you got like 12 guys armed to the teeth in a room smaller than this and there's like four of us trying to reason with them not knowing at any minute if they were just going to open fire and that's where I was like okay this is not a scenario I had planned for and this could go bad at any time. Um, so it's more situations like that, which if you ask more servicemen that have served in Af Iraq or Afghanistan, that's probably not the answer you get. It's probably a firefight or an actual kinetic situation that was scarier. But for us, we had situations like that where it's like, wow, I have no idea what the outcome's gonna be. And there's nothing the US military can do right now to help me. Was there ever a time where you thought, I, I, I need to go home, I can't do this anymore? No, not really. Like I, I did thrive on the mission. And as we had more and more success, I felt like it was part of me. I f like, I think all of us kind of got into it where it's like, this is part of, we're not just serving here. Like that's part of who we are and it's part of our life. And if you ask all the guys, they will say that it was one of the most impactful things they've done in their life. Because not only were we doing something for, you know, our country sent us to do this and we're doing it and it's working. And we're doing something that's like, what we were trained to do that nobody's ever done or done in forever and it's working and we could see that we were improving these people's life and you know and the, the motto for special forces is de oppresso liber which is to free the oppressed it's it's an awesome mission like we're going to free people and try and give them a piece of what our forefathers had given us like peace and and liberty and so when we're helping these people you know we built a school we, girls that had never gone to school before get to go to school. We, we repaired mosques. We educated people. We did things that even after we were gone, we were going to affect their society, which was awesome. Several people have said to me, I would be so happy to know my tax dollars are in your gunny sack in Afghanistan <laughs> and participating in a weapons buy, buyback program. And I'm, I'm in there. Give it all to the buyback program. Oh, that's awesome. Talk dollars how to work. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Dollars well spent. We have been so blessed to have you here 
today at In the Green Room, and I learned so much. And I have one last quick question because we only have like thirty seconds left. Okay. Did any of the um, did any of the troops uh, could, could they if they were single could they date some of the women over there? Uh, no. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. So that was a no no, and that, <laughs> that did was not a no no. That did not happen. Okay. Okay. I was wondering about that. Okay. Uh, so what was the most exciting day in Afghanistan? I think it was the day that our soldiers graduated from their training. We trained them and then we gave them uniforms and they graduated as Afghan soldiers trained by the U.S. military. And seeing these young men so proud and so excited and feeling like we are Afghans creating the new future for our country was exhilarating. It's something you just don't see. I probably will never see it again in my life. And it was awesome. You're a hero. Thank you so much for all you do for our beautiful America. Thanks for having me. And we want to have you on again. Yes, thank you. Awesome. Hammerhead 6. Go buy it. <laughs> thank you for listening to In the Green Room. Join us here live every Tuesday at 6 p.m. or anytime on demand 24-7 on StarWorldWideNetworks.com. <laughs> <laughs>